Pranakosha live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today we're talking with Johnny Lang, who is an excellent filmmaker and musician who I happened to meet on the Star Trek cruise. Yeah, yeah. Star Trek cruise. Yeah, that was super fun. That's the first time I've ever done it before. So I don't know. I assume you've done it many times. Me? No, that was my first. That was my first cruise. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. That was, uh, <laughs> I still have that song stuck in my head when you hear Star Trek Cruise. Oh, wow. Their, their branding is pretty on. No, that was... Uh, uh, <laughs> I remember hearing about a Star Trek Cruise from my mother probably 10 years ago, probably after they'd done the first cruise, which apparently was pretty small. Yeah. It mentioned something about the guy who played Harry Kim, like, doing like a, a Kung Fu class or something. Oh, <laughs> or cool. That's what I pictured. Or like doing Pilates with, you know. Harry Kim. Jerry, uh, <laughs> seven of nine, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned him because the fans really love him. He's really good. He interacts with the fans quite a bit. Yeah. And um, that's cool. That'd be fun doing a martial arts class with him because they did have a gym on the boat. I don't, I don't know. If you were up, ever went up there, but they had treadmills and stuff. And I went up there one day and right next to my treadmill was, um, David Ajala from oh, yeah. Star Trek Discovery. He played book. Yeah. He was one of my favorite characters actually. And then he was hanging out around with Anthony Montgomery, who was on, uh, um, Enterprise. Yep. Anthony Montgomery has the distinction of being a 50 something guy in a 30 something body. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever 50? seen him. Up yeah, he's 50. He looks like he's 30. No way. I, I thought I you. was older than him when that show was on. Yeah. Well, if you saw him, the thing is, like, he has no gray hairs, right? But that's easy yeah. to just dye your hair. But he doesn't have a, I swear he does not have a wrinkle on his skin. If you look at his, um, him up close, yeah. his skin looks young. Yeah. And, uh, Anyhow, so they were hanging out up there, and I was on um, a treadmill. And uh, but then I eventually b abandoned the treadmill because I realized it was way more fun just to do laps up on the top deck because they had that little uh, jogging lap. Yeah. And so when I was up there, I ran into Armin Shimmerman, who oh, okay. was Quark, of course, from yeah, Deep that's Space cool. Nine, because he liked to do laps up there. Well, I, after the cruise, I immediately followed uh, all of the actors that I had interacted with. On, I followed them on Instagram. Oh, yeah, cool. And um, Anthony, I have a few funny, I have one story about him. I don't know how much we want to talk about the cruise, but. Yeah, sure. He, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of into Star Trek. A couple stories uh, with Anthony. <laughs> so, one uh, embarrassing story, but I just saw today is he's promoting uh, a feature film that he made. And this is like, sort of straight to video stuff, but it's him and Armin Shimmerman are both in this movie. Oh wait, no, it's not him. Never mind. It's Tracy Coco and Armin Shimmerman. Tracy Coco, who we'll get to later, she was in 120 episodes of Next Gen as a featured extra. 120 episodes? Over 120. And then she played various aliens on Voyager and Deep Space Nine. Oh, cool. I just spent the weekend with her last weekend. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will have to hear all about it. Yeah, but so there was two interact, a couple interactions I had with Anthony on the cruise because, you know, I watched Enterprise once through like apparently 15, 20 years ago when it first aired, right? Okay. Was younger. Yeah, and when I saw it, I mean, when I saw Anthony, I was like, oh, yeah, he looks familiar. I've seen him in, maybe in Law and Order or something and Whatever. So he's there's he's another kind of a, Netflix those... show that he's on. I forgot what it was called. Um, I'm not sure if it's still running, but it was a couple of years ago. But I think he was one of the main characters in it. Yeah, I, um, I forget what it was. Uh, um, I mean, I could probably just look at my phone and and we can figure it out. But <laughs> uh, so you know, I did the the Gong Show the second to last night of the cruise. Right, which you were one fun. of the you contestants. Know, Anthony, Anthony was one of the. Um, it's not the Gong Show. It's the Gorn Show. The Gorn Show, yeah. The Gorn, right here. 
<laughs> so what would happen is it was like the gong show if you're if you're old enough to know what the gong show is um except what they had a gong but what they would do is they had a guy dressed as a gorn that would come out on stage and hit the gong mm -hmm. you know if somebody's act needed to be gonged <laughs> Yeah, no, he made me really nervous because I was getting towards the end of the song and I was already nervous because I hadn't got gotten to practice at all before right. getting on stage in front of 2,500 people. Oh, really? In front of my bed. And uh, I'm getting to the part, this is Radiohead's song, Lucky, mm -hmm. and I'm getting to the part where there's a little bit of an instrumental. So I was about to do the instrumental, but I heard the audience sort of cheering and I'm just in the zone. Right. I hear the audience like, saying, don't do it, don't do it. I'm like, oh, no, he's out here. I'm going to get gonged. What am I doing wrong, right? <laughs> so they didn't tell you who was going to get gonged? I figured like, they would tell you. I figured that they would tell you backstage, like everybody who would get, was going to get gonged would know ahead of time that oh, they were sort of like right. a plant. You know what I mean? No. I oh, mean, they didn't. Did you watch the performances? Yeah. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to sound rude. I mean, some people, people knew. I mean, you could tell some people designed their performance to get gonged. Maybe. You know, and then others, um, see, I figured they had it all, it was all staged. No. So that you would know who got, was going to get gonged and who wasn't. So nobody was heartbroken if they did get gonged. Right. I mean, <laughs> no, I think it was just, they just chose the people who signed up. Like I'd heard okay. about the show at a time. And so immediately I was like, well, that's like the one thing I want to do on the cruise was to perform in the talent show. Right. <laughs> because I didn't know what the cruise was going to be about. Right. I well, you also I did was... really good in the karaoke. I'm sorry? You were really good at karaoke. Oh, thank you. Too. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but no, I think they just either they drew names out of a hat and they put it on your door. Because at first my mother, I, was, I shared a room with my mom on the cruise. So that was... Uh, <laughs> that's just the way it worked out, but that's a bit uh, questionable. My mother <laughs> thought that, uh, she was picked for the talent show and I was like, for the Gorn show. And I was like, no, oh, mom, I picked? signed up for it. I got picked for it. She's like, Oh, and she's sitting, my mom was sitting there and sort of like, she's got a lot going on and she's thinking like, what am I going to perform for this? And I'm like, mom, <laughs> let's perform. They picked, I signed up for it. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you're going to have to show me how to do that because I, I have already been working on an act that I want to do on the gong show next year. Are you, signed up, for, show. Are you signed up for the, the Voyager cruise? Yeah, I'm already signed up for the cruise. Oh, nice. Um, and, I, and there's a whole bunch of excursions that we're, you're supposed to sign up for now that haven't yet. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I tried to get, I even tried to, to get the band to let me play my, my cello with them. And I was this close to doing it, but then the stage manager shut it down because he said, well, you can't be on there because you have to be on our insurance policy first. Oh, that makes sense. But then I thought, wait, that's bogus because earlier on they were doing karaoke with where anybody could walk on stage with the band and yeah. sing. So, and then those they were pretty, like I waivers. mean, they were pretty far out there. Like they were far away. Like nothing could happen. Right. Yeah. Like I think they're just worried about like people like, like falling off the it. stage or something like that or Yeah, or like trying to, you know, mosh the drum set or something. Yeah, or get electrocuted by Yeah. I mean I was doing <laughs> little kicks during creep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dominic told me like three times throughout the week how much he liked my singing. It was good. Thanks. You know, actually I, just... I had signed up to do that karaoke with the band too. Yeah, but I wimped out because I couldn't um, get my phone. I didn't have internet, and I couldn't pull up my phone for the lyrics. So oh. and I didn't know the song well enough to do it by memory. Robert. Yeah. So I, at the last second, I bailed. But yeah, that was fun. Well, it was yeah. interesting because I'll go back to the Anthony Montgomery story. But it was interesting. The first day uh, I go to the bar to sing karaoke because I was like, I just got to get away. It's been traveling. I got to go do my own thing for a little bit. And uh, I didn't know who's the, the actor from uh, Enterprise. Dominic, uh, what's his last name? Dominic Keating, yeah. Dominic Keating. Yeah. 
uh, he had just got, he must've just gotten there. I mean, I immediately, I go to the bar, I look over, LeVar Burton walks right by me. And then Jordy LaForge. Yeah. And then, uh, I'm sitting there to sign up. I start chatting with someone else who was, uh, on the cruise, like from Wisconsin or something. So we had some stuff in common. We just start, keep talking. And, um, I get up and sing and I see this guy in like a soccer Jersey, like a soccer uniform and his wife, his girlfriend or whatnot, is just standing watching. And afterwards he's like, Oh, that was really good. And he's got like an accent and he shakes my hand. And I was like, Hey, what's your name? And he's like, I'm Dominic. I'm like, Oh, Hey, I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you. I uh, hope to see you on the cruise. Try to make some friends around here. He's like, Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> and then I realized like the day later, I'm like, Oh, he's one of the actors that I uh -huh. guys that are on this cruise. Um, so yeah, I didn't really think a chance story really like that too. That with many of the actors on the cruise, but it was kind of cool to have them around. And yeah, that's the cool thing birds. about the cruise is you get to hang out with all these different Star Trek actors. Yeah. I noticed some of them were kind of reclusive. Like some of them you didn't even know they were on the cruise until you saw them like one time on some variety show thing. Yeah. And then other ones were, were way more sociable and we'd intermingle with everybody. Yeah. Well, that was yeah. uh, true for... Um, uh, Dana, Dana, no, Denise Crosby. Oh, she was on the cruise. Yeah, I didn't even know. Yeah, she. Uh, I saw her hanging out with fans every day. I saw her and Nana oh, visitor. I was just not in the right spot then. Hanging out, talking to people. Nana I really want visitor was hanging people. out with people. I'm sorry, Dana, Nana visitor. Yeah, Nana like visitor. One of the last nights, they were just chilling down in the lounge on the promenade, just with a bunch of fans at the table having coffee and hanging out. And, Oh, shoot. I missed both of them. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I've worked, I've worked in the television a few times and worked with celebrities, so I try to maintain uh, just a, a rule for myself, like don't get too crazy, sort of don't speak unless spoken to or unless you're, like, sitting there in an elevator with them. And they're like, hey, how's it going? You know, I talked right. to Sonequa's husband, who was on Walking Dead a couple times. He was a nice guy. I mean, I stopped Sonequa, Sonequa Martin before. Green's husband? I'm sorry, yeah, Sonequa Sonequa Martin Green's yeah. husband. From uh, Star Trek Discovery. Yeah. The captain. And, and But they were both in Walking Dead together. Oh. Oh, I didn't watch that show. I mean, I watched a couple episodes, but... I watched it until it got bad. <laughs> it was still... Well, it was I guess bad. by the time I started, I watched a few episodes, I was like, well, this is the worst show ever. I mean, it's yeah. stupid. Like, I remember the episode that I watched. I watched an episode because a friend of mine was a guest star in it. And I, it was an hour long, and I was like, nothing's happening in this episode. Absolutely yeah. zero. All they're doing is hacking um, zombies, and that's it. Uh, it <laughs> There's no storyline. With the uh, Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I stopped her in the hallway, and I mentioned it in my documentary. Uh, <laughs> like, gave her a high five and told her she was beautiful. And at that night, I was dressed as uh, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I told her I was going to cast her in Jurassic Park 17 when we got around <laughs> yeah. to it. <laughs> and she was she was pretty cool. She was uh she had said some stuff on um the Stephen Colbert show about uh, how much she liked the fans and oh yeah and how and then she said us some other things during the cruise how she doesn't like celebrity culture and all this stuff and you know she doesn't want to be special in that way she just wants to like do her work yeah she's really cool. nice I I got that same vibe from her yeah um, when admirable. she did some of her panels um. And so on. Yeah. Well, another person uh, that I thought was a real kick on the cruise was Todd Stashwick. Oh, man. I want to meet him so bad. Yeah. He. Well, did you see the one thing where he, he did a Dungeons & Dragons thing and he was the dungeon master? No, I missed that. That's kind of his that thing. That was really good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I missed that. I think that was the day I went on one of my boring excursions. I should have stayed on the ship. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then he also... That one variety night, he sang Come Sail Away. And I was really surprised how well he sang it and also how high his voice is. Because yeah. his speaking voice isn't that high, but when he sings, he's got a really nice high tenor voice. You must have uh, yeah. had a different pass than I had where they did a different show. I don't remember him. Maybe I did see that. Uh, no, I mean, it was just the main. Uh, let's see. So what show was it? Um I don't it was just one, you know how they have those variety night things where they do all, some people sing and other people yeah. tell jokes. And um, I think it was the same night that um, 
that uh, uh, Robert Picardo sang. Okay, no, I saw that. Yeah, it was one of the last nights. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was later on in the cruise. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that was um, quite exciting. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think. What are the most memorable things? Um, then, of course, um, John Delancey was on the cruise. Oh man, I loved his performances. The 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 he brought that whole band, the whole, the orchestra. Like right. He brought people that were. Um, he brought alumni from Curtis Institute. Yeah, that's right. His dad was president of Curtis. Yeah. And then uh, his dad also was a very uh, accomplished oboe player. Yeah, he had mentioned that. So yeah. I went to like the rehearsal night and then I went to like the official night. And it's cool because right. the one night I went, Brent Spiner sat right behind me. Oh, cool. So I'm just sitting there while John and Brent are like just having a chat talking about music and stuff. And then I just kept turning back and sort of like. Oh, interesting. This is like a cool so episode. What is, is Brent Spiner a musician? Oh, I don't know. Huh, oh, I never knew that. I'm sure he did some singing on Star Trek. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he tried. He pretended to play the violin. Actually, he did pretty good for somebody who wasn't a violin player. Yeah. So um, that's interesting. Because, um, yeah, on the cruise, I was pushing my. I was. I'm trying to promote my image as the Star Trek cello guy. Yeah. So I was like carrying a cello around, but I also play violin. Yeah. And violin is actually my main instrument from way back. But so well, there has to be a uh, you probably had to go through a lot with to even get the cello on board. Um, yeah, it wasn't that bad. I mean, what I did was I didn't bring my good cello from Seattle. I just rented a cello in Orlando and then just carried it on. And there wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. So no, I wanted to bring my guitar and I'm just I've never traveled with it. I'm like, I don't want to risk losing my guitar on the cruise or. Right. Would not or have the extra baggage, but we like flew first class on the way there, and I'm like, I probably would have been fine. But next time, yeah, I know. Like, I can carry my violin on on a plane, but a guitar is bigger. I don't know if they would let you carry that on because it has to be able to fit in either, in the, either under the seat or in those overhead bins. Right, right. For sure, you can't carry a cello on. So, and wait, so I how'd you get the cello on? Well, no, see, I didn't. I didn't bring my cello. What I did was when I landed in Orlando, um, I just rented a cello. Oh, okay. And, that makes sense. And just uh, brought it on the cruise. Because what you have to do, I mean, you can either check your cello, which is really risky. Uh, but what some people do is they get this special type of cello case that's kind of in, has all this extra padding and is relatively indestructible. And then they'll put it, they'll check it. Um, or what you have to do is buy a ticket for your cello and put it in the seat next to you. Yikes. So I didn't want to do any of those things, so I just rented one. But to <laughs> tell you the truth, you know what? Um, it might have been cheaper for me to buy a seat because it cost me 300 bucks to rent that cello for a, for a week. And it wasn't even that good of a cello either. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised how much they charged me. So, anyway. So, uh, okay. So, uh, besides Star Trek stuff, I mean, we can always get back to that. So, you're also you said your main gig is as a filmmaker. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I went to film school, graduated two thousand three. Oh wow! And you know, I did short films in I went to Columbia College in Chicago. Um, oh. Did some short film stuff Wait there. A when I was there, but nothing. Uh, I mean, there's some stuff I still share today that I think is interesting. Did uh, you say Columbia College in Chicago? Yeah. I thought there's a Columbia University in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, you know, isn't that like Ivy League uh, school? So, Columbia College is not affiliated with Columbia University. Okay. So, Columbia College is just like a liberal arts school. So, lots of dance, theater, music, film, like... That Huge school, fun. open admissions. Like it was a good opportunity for me with a you know middle uh, <laughs> middle of the road uh, GPA to get into a school where I could you know do art. But you know it costs money. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's much more expensive now. But I went to mm -hmm. school there ninety eight to two thousand three, um, and then you know I got out of school and you know 
we learned it. We learned in the um, what do you call it? We learned a lot of analog filmmaking. So we were still shooting on like high eight. We were shooting on you know sixteen millimeter, et cetera, and learning that. By okay. the time I graduated school, the industry had already shifted towards to digital. So I was just like, okay, so what the heck am I going to do now? So I didn't do much. I ended up just. Well, let me ask you a question. So, because, um, I mean, I just just started getting into YouTube and stuff after everything went to digital too. So, back in the days when you did do film, what were the issues that you had to deal with? Besides, I assume you have to save film. You can't do as many takes because unless you've got oodles of money. But what other kind of stuff do you have to deal with in that type of situation? Well, I mean, honestly, like, I mean, I didn't shoot much on film. So we, there were like two classes where we had the Bolex, the 16 millimeter Bolex, and you had about maybe 10 minutes to sh of film to shoot on. So okay. the first semester was black and white. The sec second semester was color with sync sound, right? And it's just all, they all, it all looked like crap because I couldn't get the lighting right. So you, what you, you right. would do is like shoot outside get a little light meter and then hope for the best. And then all of a sudden you're looking at it two days later and it's all overexposed or underexposed. <laughs> Nothing's consistent. I mean, that's what you do in film school is experiment, but it wasn't until my third or fourth year where we just shot on the PD 150, which was a, a, a Panasonic. Was it Sony? I had to look it up. Um, we shot on the PD 150, which is like the same camera they used uh, for Dogma 95. Are, we fam are you familiar with that? For what? Dogma 95? No. It was a uh, uh, like a filmmaking challenge put out by the uh, filmmaker Lars von Trier. Okay. He did like, Dancer in the Dark and Breaking the Waves. And um, so he had all these filmmakers would shoot with these with these digital cameras. Okay. And just audio only from the camera, video only from the camera, no lighting, all natural lighting. Uh, if there was another cameraman in the scene. You wouldn't even edit it out. The actors would improvise. Hmm. And so it was like, uh, Lars von Trier, Homie Corrine, uh, Steve Soderbergh did a whole Dogma 95 movie. Uh, I can't tell you which one it was. Huh. Um, Interesting. And then, you know, David Lynch shot Inland Empire on the PD-150, and that was in 2006. Huh. Uh, and so it's mostly just a way to promote that camera. Was that the idea? It was just a new technology that filmmakers wanted, wanted to experiment with. PD-150 had sort of a grain to it, I guess, that made it uh, admirable to filmmakers who weren't shooting on film. Hmm. Uh, so sort of high details and better balance of light. Hmm. Well, you can always just add that in with software. At least these days. Yeah. No, uh, these days you can definitely do, to do that. But this was, you know, 2003. Okay. Yeah. Where you could do it, but it probably took a lot more time and money than was needed. I see. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, no, I didn't do much until, so I worked retail for 12 years before uh, I was uh, laid off and, uh, you know, had a whole like eight months to figure it out and ended up getting a job working at a summer camp for kids as a filmmaker in residence. And, oh, that sounds uh, fun. Yeah, I was able to buy all this equipment. Uh, for like half price afterwards, I was like, well, screw it. I'm just going to start making movies and content, which is what I did. So it was like a week or was it a whole summer or how does it? It was, summer, it was about five weeks. So well, five weeks. What's it called? Stephen Cates. Interesting. And it's like an yeah. immersive summer camp for filmmaking? Sort of. No, no, no. It was just uh, one of their like studios. They call them studios. So it's like sort of the Montessori model where this kids can all just kind of run around and do what they want without like a lot of discipline. Okay. Besides like rounding them up at the end of the day and making sure they don't, you know, break things, break okay. appendages. What age level? Uh, between like five and 16. All mixed together or are they kind of yeah. segregated? No, all, all mixed together. Oh <laughs> yeah. It was, I did the one year, a good friend of mine, um, uh, as uh, literally works for the company. He runs his own camp uh, okay. outside of Atlanta. Wow. Uh, but yeah, so I joined a, uh, there's a really great film club that I uh, joined in Chicago called group three, one, two, and they've got a, like a really cool uh, philosophy. They've been doing this for 20 years. I came in in 2017 and okay. there's probably like maybe eight core members 
And so each uh, we get together each month. And the idea is that every month, each person in the group makes a, a new film based on a, a, a subject that everyone votes on. Huh. So we can say like this month's theme is the, the, the theme for this month is so many people died here. Right. So all of us have gone off. We're all just making our own video based on that theme. Okay. And so at the end of the month, we all come together and we show our movies. Huh. And, and they're like 10 minutes long or, how, or I've made stuff. Sometimes it's a minute long. Sometimes it's 15 minutes long. I've done like just maybe an experimental video this month and the next month I've spent $500 because I've written a script, hired actors and got a location to shoot mm -hmm. at. So it's just whatever the ideas happen, that's okay. like, that's my goal, right? To just hmm. continue to make things regardless of like, am I going to put this at a festival? Mm -hmm. Am I going to get a thousand million views on YouTube. Do I want to go viral on TikTok? I mean, that's not the point. It's just continually just to get better and better at the, the craft and just, just explore any idea you have and just make something out of it. Right. Learn by doing. Yeah. Well, that's the YouTube way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I made, I don't know, since 2017, 30, 40 short films, documentary. Oh, wow. Some of them are like a nice little horror story, beginning, middle, end. Some are just like an experiment. I made a couple of films where I'm just walking through a park for 12 minutes and picking up a Polaroid and going into a loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's testing the limits of the audience. Yeah. Oh, it's fun. Wow. And then, um, so, your, so your musician stuff is that, like, do you play gigs and stuff like in Chicago? Uh, I haven't for a while. I had a band back in uh, Bloomington Normal. That's where I'm from, Bloomington, Illinois. Um, okay. We were called Zero Johnny. We put out an EP in 2011. Okay. 2010. Our what drummer, kind of stuff? A, uh, um, I mean, he's got like two doctorates now, two PhDs. Um, uh, great guy, uh, Chris. Um, uh, so he had just had recording projects. He was like, "Hey, I'll record you and I'll play on your band on your record." I'm like, "All right, cool, let's do it." So huh. I put out this uh, six track EP called the Zero Johnny, the Dirty EP. Huh, cool. And we did we did shows in Chicago and Rockford, Bloomington. Sort of fun time to have a band because it was like on my list of things to do artistically. Right. And uh, but no, I I don't play much in Chicago. Just open mic nights if I feel like it. I'll still like dabble with uh, songwriting. Etc. Um, but still, you know, if I get excited about something, I want to learn it, or there's a song in my head, get like an earworm. Yeah, I'll, I'll explore that. You score it up. Well, will you? Uh, and then will you just like make a lead sheet for it or something, or will you actually score it all out and actual sheet? No, music? usually it's just whatever melody I have. I find the chords that work with it and sort of like go back and forth with that. So nothing. Okay. Uh, right. Sometimes a. Music comes first. Sometimes the lyrics come first. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's the same uh, well, that's the songs, idea. Too. The best ones that come together at the same right. time. Yeah. That's cool. So your drummer got two doctorates in what? Oh, I don't know. Biology. <laughs> oh, okay. So it wasn't like music or audio engineering no, or something no, like no. that. I mean, he's, tal he's a talented guy, but no, it was like, I think it's biology and chemistry or something. Yeah. Wasn't that the case with everybody in Boston? Like, weren't they all, like, super intelligent? Oh, the band Boston? Yeah. Yeah. I think I've heard that, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you got to be smart to uh, be a musician, right? Yeah, that's true. And a lot, most crazy. musicians have a side gig. Yeah. You know? Actually, most actors have to have a side gig, too. That Acting pays even worse than being a musician. Yeah. Typically. <laughs> Well, that was one of the really cool things uh, I liked about the Star Trek Picard panel uh -huh. was uh, somebody had asked Michelle Hurd, the actor Michelle Hurd, about the the Screen Actors Guild strike. Mm -hmm. And like her passion for that was really inspiring. You know, I mean, I know I know actors, but I don't know a lot of actors who are actually sad. Right. I work with like indie actors, mm -hmm. uh, writers, you know, and, you know, she really said you think that these people are driving around LA in a Rolls Royce. I said, no, they pay rent. They're living in studio apartments. They're not 
rich. And I think it's yeah, they're just getting well, by, barely getting by. Yeah, and there's a reason. Even Michelle Hurd, that you've seen on Star Trek, you've seen on uh, Law and Order. Even she could use the extra paycheck, right? And come hang out on the cruise with us. Well, cool yeah, see, but you know, there's money involved, <laughs> right? Well, um, yeah. So um, unless you're a lead on a show and you're doing it, you you get you're doing episodes every week you get a regular paycheck. But if you're like a type of actor that's just a guest star, mm -hmm. I mean, if you land a guest star role in some big name show, you might get paid several thousand bucks for that week. But then you don't get another gig for a month or two. That's all the money you get. So that's not enough money to live on. Right. Absolutely. So you have to have some kind of side job to get by in between. So uh, that's super did you common. watch... Did you see this uh, Michael J. Fox uh, documentary called Still? Uh, no, I didn't see that one. Oh, it's fantastic. One of my favorite movies last year. Huh. And uh, um, when he was on Family Ties, he had okay. been on Family Ties for two or two seasons, I think, when okay. he was cast in Teen Wolf and then Back to the Future. Okay. And he was still living in a studio apartment and washing dishes he had one sink his bathroom sink was the sink he's washing dishes in his bathroom sink oh, wow. meanwhile shooting family ties during the day and then doing overnights for back to the future at the same time jeez <laughs> sleeping in his trailer like between takes and oh just that's a good like, story I, think, I don't know six weeks of that and he wow. still like, he didn't get a paycheck where he could like change apartments until after back to the future had come out and then it turned out to be a hit yeah and yeah, then he still has like wait to get paid right so he's like living in the studio apartment washing dishes in the sink and he's like one of the most famous people on the planet like <laughs> now he is right <laughs> at the time well he was known on family ties if you watch that show yeah huh. yeah what did i say family ties yeah yeah yeah, but I mean, he didn't really make it big until Back to the Future. And right, then, and then it was like this Michael J. Fox renaissance where it was right. Back to he the Future, the and then the studio had kind of shelved Teen Wolf, and they sort of waited to see what would happen with Michael J. Fox, yeah. and then they released it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, apparently, that was the case with William Shatner, too. He said after Star Trek, he was pretty much broke. Yeah. Yeah, or, and even I think even during Star Trek, he wasn't making that much money. Um, yeah, that's just the way. I mean, that's how it goes with actors. Yeah, got to have some other other thing going, or got or have rich parents or rich relatives or somebody that <laughs> keeps you afloat in between projects. Right. Yeah. Very Even interesting. Then. So, uh, so now I'm going to backtrack. So, when you were in your band, like, uh, what kind of stuff did your band do? How can you, how would you describe it to be? Oh man, I would say I was, you know, a big Radiohead fan. I think when I was writing songs, I was listening to a band called The Deers a lot. If you're familiar with The Deers, uh, -uh. uh I can't even really tell you the names of the members or anything, but really, just kind of like. Real melody based, like just kind of a cool acoustic, like pop rock. I wasn't trying to do anything like super experimental. I just wanted to make some like cool pop songs that I liked to sing. Okay. To sort of showcase my voice. And then which decade was this? Was this the 90s? Uh, when I was playing, this was, I started the band and I think we started playing like 2010, 2009. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. about. 15 years ago now. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a very cool experience, but yeah, I went on, I don't want to compare it to, you know, I listened to a lot of, you know, I got to see the band Interpol on their, for their first show in LA. Okay. I lived there briefly. So, you know, Interpol's big influence. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can find, I sold the record. It's on SoundCloud. Oh, okay. And I made a, I made a music, a new music video for one of the songs. It's on my YouTube channel. Oh, cool. Under, okay. Uh, Johnny, Johnny Lang films. Okay. 
Yeah, we'll put a link to your YouTube channel down in the description. Oh, right on. So everybody can yep. check it out. Well, if you go on there, you can also see my documentary about yeah. the Star how to go on a Star Trek cruise. I watched it. It was good. <laughs> oh, in fact, I was in it. You were in it. The Star yeah. Trek cello guy is in it about halfway through. Yeah. When we yeah. were, uh, I can't remember what deck it was, but we found a little place where where we were just sort of jamming on some sort of blues type of stuff. Yeah. Well, I tried yeah. to do the documentary and uh, to show pairs, right? So mm -hmm. they were on deck nine. Deck nine. Okay. Because at the end, I have my little moment of clarity uh -huh. after the Will Wheaton uh, story night. And I walk okay. up to deck nine, listen to music, and have like a little, I don't know, moment of clarity is what I'll call it. Okay. Sure. Also, the clouds you know, part, and now you can see clearly. Yeah. <laughs> see the direction of your life, you know, <laughs> and all the things the that are going to happen. Life. On a Star yeah. Trek cruise to go boldly. Yeah. Boldly. Yeah, go boldly, yeah. Um or you can just kind of sit out on the deck and look at the water and meditate upon the nature of the universe. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. I really I would I couldn't look at the water for more than like twenty seconds without getting sick. So Oh really? Yeah, I had a rough time the first couple days. Huh, interesting. Because yeah. I didn't get the slightest bit seasick. Because, I mean, this, the water was really calm. Yeah, it was just that the first night was bad. Really? It was because we were right at the front of the ship. Oh, maybe that's it. That's where and your like, um, cabin is? You could hear the waves crash, and it just was not. Whatever happened with my equilibrium, it was just not, not working for me. So, course, yeah, that first day was rough. But Maybe that's because I think my cabin was sort of midship. So, it's like yeah. a seesaw. If you're on the ends of the ship, then it's way worse. So in the mm -hmm. middle, it's hardly anything because you're near the fulcrum. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that was it. Okay. Yeah, if I know. Mm -hmm. But somebody saved me. They gave me those little bracelets that sort of put a dot, like. Oh, yeah. I remember. It might have but it worked. I wore, those, I wore those all week. I remember I was seeing people have, or people would have these dots on their neck. You know, yeah, it's like, what cool. is that? And then somebody finally told me it's like the seasick uh time release medication thing mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the i tried to wear the patch at first it was like be, it goes like behind right. Your, right here yeah yeah but um i think that made it worse because i started feeling better i put on the bracelets and then i okay. started feeling better once i took that medication off interesting yeah hmm so i guess you, people manage their seasickness in different ways motion mm -hmm. sickness very interesting okay well, I signed up for next year, so I'm going to be on the cruise again. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, uh, my mom will be there. I will not. Oh, uh, okay. So I don't know how many stories I get, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of promotion here. So Yeah, let's hear that. You can do some promo. Uh, you know, my mother and I have a lot in common in terms of like, we're always like creating things, uh, trying to do the next the next thing, right? Always got to have something happening. Like I've got mm -hmm. three projects right now. Uh, so after the cruise, my mom started to feel like really – sort of homesick okay. for like Star Trek community. <laughs> oh yeah. There's yeah. people that are already talking about next year already. There's a, there's a yeah. Facebook group that's already created for it and people are already making plans. I mean, it's next February and people are already making plans for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my mother just, we're from Bloomington Normal, which mm -hmm. is central Illinois, home to Illinois State University, Illinois Wesleyan, uh, State Farm Insurance, Mitsubishi Motor Plant, like it's kind of a cool small town, really centrally located, lots of good restaurants. I always say there's one of everything. Like if you okay. want to go to like a fine arts cinema, there's one of those. If you want to go to a fancy restaurant, there's one of those, right? Um, so my mother decided to start her own Star Trek convention. Really? It's a normal. So she calls it the Subspace Midwest convention okay and she has uh she started promoting this probably three months ago and this was uh the event was last weekend oh wow how did it go uh it went well it was fun uh we had a maybe 30 40 people uh who showed up fans okay. local and a few others who showed up uh one guy who was on the cruise it was named larry okay 
And you remember him, he was the guy who looked exactly like Scotty from the movies. Oh, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. And he had a really good um, uniform, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So he had a really cool story about how that happened. Um, okay. So he came along. Um, cool. And it was, you know, all inclusive. We had, there was events that happened. I directed a stage reading of Rascals. Mm-hmm. The next year episode of Rascals. And cool. then uh, when my mother was starting this convention, she got an email from Tracy Coco, who I had mentioned earlier. Uh-huh. Uh, she was at 120 episodes of Next Generation as a featured extra. She played Riker's date in a few episodes, Picard's date. She played uh, Ferengi. Uh, she's on the bridge. She's on the bridge in Generations. Okay. How do you spell Coco? Uh, C-O-C-O. Okay, I'm so gonna look T-R-A-C-E-E. her up right now. T R A C E E. T R A. Coco C O C O. C O. Maybe another O. Okay, let's see if I recognize her. Oh, okay. Okay, she looks familiar. Oh, there she is in a whole bunch of different episodes. Uh, but she's also in a famous blooper where Jonathan Franks is c- sort of screwing around and chases an extra down the hallway and yells Tracy as he chases her down the hallway. And this is Tracy Coco. Yeah. Uh, so she was really nice. Uh, she came down along with a um, another local vendor, uh, this guy, uh, Chris, who runs Paladin's Gate Comics. Cool. Uh, who, that's also in Blinks and Normal. He's ex-military. Has this great comic book shop? Does like um, re- does like touch ups for I don't know a lot about comic books, but he does like touch ups for comic books, like valuable comic books. Hmm. He finds the right ink to make them, put them back in mint condition, that kind of thing. Huh. Uh, but he's another sponsor for the weekend, and uh, another artist who I forget his name uh, was there. Uh, but yeah, we had a good crowd, and uh, everyone seemed to have a lot of fun. One person said it. It was like their grandmother knitted a Star Trek convention. Hmm. Are you doing one next year? It's a good quote. And we are doing one next year. So my mother's one is organizing it all. I'm going to have a little bit to do with it. Uh, probably do another stage reading. If not, try to reach out to some actors to try to get uh, some more people involved. But the, the, I mean, the whole idea is that the fans are the stars, right? Right. So, yeah. Well, I might uh, be convinced to go. You should come. I next have a year. fan It'll series. Be a lot of fun. I have my own fan series, and I'm the captain on it. There you go. Let's so, do it. I could go there as both the Star Trek cello guy and also as um, Captain Matthew A. Hardinger, who actually play, right. who plays the cello on my show, too. That's kind of how the Star Trek cello guy <laughs> That's came awesome. Being. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, she had – we also uh, – Like, can I sleep on your sale. couch? I'm sorry? <laughs> Can I crash on your couch? <laughs> oh, well, I don't live there. Um, but uh, there will be a hotel. So okay. she did uh, the the. There was, it was not for profit, right? So you know the ticket price was a little bit high, but it just covered the expense of the right. uh, weekend. Hopefully, as it progresses over the next couple of years, uh, it'll get more affordable. Right. Uh, well, I don't have bigger, to get paid better. as long as like as long as I can like just come down and make a weekend. Out. It's a weekend thing. Yeah. So we started Friday night, Saturday all day, and then Sunday morning. That sounds fun. Yeah. A lot <laughs> of fun. And then, you know, you can do the stage reading. I don't know what episode we'll do next year, but probably not Rascals sure, I'll do that. that has 25 I'll do that. characters in it. I'll bring my cello, too. I mean, I can, like, or I'll rent another. I won't bring my cello, but I can rent a cello in. This is in Illinois, right? Yeah. Okay. Bloomington, Illinois. I'll rent one of Illinois' best cellos. I have. Uh, I will have recommendations for where to rent a cello in Bloomington Normal. Okay, and it would. And the date would be what? Approximately would be uh, what? Probably in June, middle of June. Okay. Uh, don't do it on June twenty first because I for sure can't go if it's that weekend. All right, that was well. It was last weekend that we did it, so it was June twenty first. Have you already planned next year? I think so. Yeah. Well, no, it's still it's still working towards it. So we've, there's they've started a committee, a planning committee for next year. 
Okay, I would like to campaign for not June twenty first because okay. I can't. I definitely cannot go that weekend because my. I'll give you. Plays I'm sure then. if you want to talk to my mom, she'll be more than happy to talk Trek with you on your uh, on your show. <laughs> yeah, uh, and she will have much more to say than I will. Okay, very. Good. That's that sounds good. Um, did they have? I assume they don't have much of a budget, right? Oh, for this convention, no. There's, it's, it's no budget. It's all. So they don't have the, enough to like um, get a Star Trek actor to show up. Well, I mean, Tracy was. I mean, Tracy was really nice. She was really cool to hang out with. Uh, we really got to know her and like her. And she even watched. They all like after the convention was over, she stayed around mm -hmm. and then went to my parents' house and watched Generations with them, so cool. she could point out all the scenes that she was in. So that was pretty cool for my parents to have this person in their house. Um, well, if you could turn it into a fundraiser for pancreatic cancer, then you could get Armin Shimmerman to do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because he's he is, his wife is a, survivor, a pancreatic cancer survivor. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. I really missed out on the Armin Shimmerman Shakespeare stuff on the cruise. I wish oh. I had seen that, that stuff. The second one. The second master class he did, I was the yeah. I was the guy that he coached in front of everybody. Oh, you said that. That would have been great. I yeah, mean, it was really fun. That. that would have been so awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I'm sure there's okay. highlights online. Yeah, okay, let's think here. So who else? Okay, there's gotta be. So it would be cool if there was because most of these people live either in LA or in Atlanta, and both places are plain right away. But I guess, you know. Mm. Okay. Did I say J.G. Hertzler? Yeah. Okay. Um, Tim Russ. Yeah, that's all I can Okay, think of well, right while now. we're thinking, yeah. let me tell you my Anthony Montgomery story. Okay, let's hear it. Well, one is embarrassing for me mm -hmm. because I was trying to find because he was up there on stage with me for the 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 Gorn show, right? Right, the Gorn show. Yep. And I was trying to like find an excuse to like talk to him, right? Have something okay. in common, but I didn't, you know. Okay. So, but there's a local cinema in Chicago called Sweet Void Cinema that does like, uh, it's like a little black box theater. It's literally, they made this theater from a grant from AMC theaters to open up a cinema in a uh, underprivileged neighborhood, right? Okay. So they'll show classic films all for free, independent films, and they show like cult films. Okay. The guy who runs it is obsessed with the Leprechaun movies. Okay. And Anthony Montgomery's in Leprechaun 5. Oh. He's in Leprechaun in the Hood. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on stage, uh, and Anthony comes up and shakes my hand. And so I pat him on the back, and I said, I love Leprechaun in the Hood. And he looks at me like, <laughs> like, gives me this face. And I was like, oh, God, what the fuck did I just do? What did I just <laughs> uh -huh. say to this actor? I'm sure it's the last thing he wanted to hear. He's just being nice, shaking my hand, telling me good job. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I love Leprechaun in the Hood. I'm like, John. <laughs> So I'm guessing it was kind of a trashy movie. Yeah, I mean Warwick Davis is in it. Hmm. You know he was the, he was little uh, little Ewok in Return of the Jedi, and he was um, um, Willow. Oh, he's Willow. Okay. Um. So the last day we're leaving the ship, right? Okay. And I, uh, the night before, I'm walking home. I'm walking back to my cabin, and Anthony walks by, and he okay. goes, "Oh, hey, Johnny, what's up?" And hands me like a card for his uh, uh, his book called Trek Talk, oh, which he had written. He's put out. It's on Amazon. Okay. And I'm like, okay. And so I must. I don't know what happened at that moment, but I must have reached down and grabbed something on the ground, or maybe I thought it was my key or something. And I go back to my cabin. I get in the room just fine. not even thinking about it. And I still got this red CPAS card in my pocket. And you, like, need your red CPAS card with your name on it 
when you to exit the ship, right? Okay. So I go to security and I'm in line. Oh, and that was his card? And they scan my card and it's not me. He's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Jonathan Lang. I'm in 1812. They asked me like four times. These guys are really intense. I had Anthony Montgomery's seat pass card in my pocket. Ah. I didn't have my card was gauze. I don't know if we switched cards or what. Uh-huh. But, so he's still um, trapped on the ship even now? I don't know. Because he was right behind <laughs> me. And they kept paging for him as where I'm going to get my – they finally let me through. And they kept paging for him afterwards because paging I think they Anthony thought like, Montgomery. this Anthony guy Montgomery, must have stolen his identity or like to figure out like, like – how did this how did this person get your card? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, wh- I think you were there the last karaoke night where Anthony and Connor were like running the karaoke. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Didn't you do a Radiohead song that night too? I don't think so. I just did um I sang Love Shack with um Oh yeah, Love Shack. With Klingon Klingon karaoke with Mary Chifo. Yeah, I wasn't Klingon karaoke, though. Okay, so maybe you weren't at the one that I was at. And the last night, Anthony and uh, Connor did a karaoke night. Well, I was there. I went to that, but I didn't sing. I oh, was just hanging didn't? out with my mom. She was singing. Okay. Yeah, I sang that one. I sang Earth Angel. Did I see uh, that? Yeah. Well, on the Mary Chifo and karaoke Anthony didn't night. even know the song. I'm like, dude, you don't even know this song. Come on, man. I know the song. Yeah. Earth Angel? Yeah. From Back to the Future. Yeah. Well, it's also a, a well-known 50s song by the Penguins. Yeah. Earth Angel, Earth Angel. I know that song. Will you be my Yeah. <laughs> no, that's in the that's in the, the canon, the permanent jukebox. Yep. 80s. Yep. It deserves to be in there. It's a great song. So, yeah. I'm trying to think. So, Gorn, the Gorn Gong Show. Okay. And then you sang. I thought you sang really well. And then, so whose guitar did you use? If it wasn't your uh, It was just provided by the crews. They just had a guitar. Oh, okay. The guy, the other songwriter uh, who played, who actually won... Uh, that night, uh, his name is Austin, I think. Uh, he's in a band called the Mr. Data Band. Mr. Data Band. They put out. They have like four records, and every song is a reference to a Star Trek episode. Uh huh. But it kind of tries to dig deep into the emotion of it. They're actually really good. They kind of have like this sort of Ryan Adams meets Death Cab for Cutie vibe. Hmm. Uh, they're really good. Definitely check them out on Spotify. Kind of like, like the Roddenberries. The Roddenberries? Yeah, have you heard of that band? No. They always play at uh, Star Trek Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. They're basically a Star Trek band. Cool. And they play all kinds of songs that have Star Trek references to them. The Roddenberries, as in Gene Roddenberry. Right, right, right. That's the idea. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I tried cool. to get uh, a punk rock band together a while back. We were going to be called SETI Alpha 6. <laughs> it was just my songs the Star Trek theme songs, but it would just be the, the girls like, you ever hear this band called Nashville pussy? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. This was like a, um, hardcore, like metal band that used to play like the bars when I was uh, like 17, 18, they played the gallery in normal Illinois. Okay. And, uh, they were just these girls from Nashville who were just like gorgeous, like seven feet tall, like just, motorcycle checks and they just play this really great kind of fun like hardcore metal rock wow. so i was like i want to do a star trek version of that except it's just me like rockabilly guy with like you know star trek girls in various stages of undress and green makeup <laughs> that could work i didn't have any songs or you know girls right. i would be willing to ask to do that you have to have you ever gone to star trek las vegas no you should go I want to. That's really fun. And uh, I, let's see. So you're in Chicago. So now let's figure out how far is Chicago from Las Vegas? It's still a plane ride, right? Yeah, I would definitely fly, yeah. So, so it's probably 200 bucks, maybe $300 oh, yeah. for a plane. Way cheaper than a cruise. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you should do it. It's really fun. Thinking about it. Yeah. I've got, I've gone uh, three years. Has it been three years? So I think this will be my fourth year when I go this year. Yeah. And I end up hanging out in the vendor room most of the time now. Because uh, um, the deal is, is like the really A-list Star Trek actors, um, when they sign autographs, you got to stand in line and they have a special room all their own and all this stuff and they mm-hmm. do photo ops. But then the people that are one notch down are in the vendor room and they just have a table. And a lot of times they don't even have a line. You can just walk up to their table and yeah. talk to them for however long. And then sometimes some of the big name ones are in there too, like um, Anson Mount was in there, and Jonathan Frakes, mm-hmm. and Doug Jones. Um, when I went to back. my first Star Trek, well, it was Comic Con, but Star Trek was there, and yeah. you know, I waited in line to meet Brent Spiner. Uh-huh. I didn't get in. This was the last. This is one of the last cons Nimoy did. Oh yeah, okay. In Chicago. And I didn't get in line for Nemo or Shatner, but I just went into the other room and there's John Delancey, Avery Brooks, Walter Koning. Oh, Avery Brooks was there? Patrick Stewart. I'm sorry. Avery, Avery Brooks? Brooks was there. Oh, wow. I remember he was very stoned. <laughs> <laughs> and then Patrick Stewart. I thought Stewart that's just how he normally is. It's just very. His son was there. Stoic. Stoic and, you know. He was so stoked because I did a I did a whole day of panels of okay. individual panels. So it was like Adam West and Burt Ward. Oh, cool! I when took was a this? Next to Adam West, that was pretty cool. And then um, Bat- the Batman, the '60s yeah. Batman, Adam West and Ro- Batman yeah. and Robin. And then Linda Hamilton and the other guy from the first Terminator. Oh, oh! And it was oh, one man. after another: John Delancey, Brent Spiner, Avery Brooks. Which Comic Con was this? Oh, this was. 2010 i think oh man yeah it was a lot of fun yeah that sounds fun went with my ex sister-in-law but uh yeah that was really cool so but yeah it was just a small so you just walk right up and there they were yeah that's what's so fun about this stuff that year john delancey had just done breaking bad hmm so that whole arc on his whole arc on that show was so cool. And I was like, Oh my God, breaking bad was so good. Like I want to get your autograph for that. He was like, well, $40. I'm like, I don't have $40, but thank you. <laughs> you wanted a free autograph. I tried, but he gave my okay. ex sister-in-law a free selfie. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's, this is what's cool in the, in the vendor room. Uh, most people will say, okay, the the range is somewhere between fifty and a hundred dollars for an autograph, um, depending on the actor. But then almost all of them will tack on a selfie for another ten bucks. Yeah, and that's the fun thing to have: is you get a selfie with this well-known Star Trek actor, and they'll usually let, let you take a couple of them because you just do it on your own phone. So. I got a really good set of selfies with um, J.J. Hertzler. What we did is we staged this stop action thing where it looked like I was punching him, like we were just got in oh, a yeah. fight. So we did... and uh, Or was he punching me? I can't remember. I'll have to go back and look. But it was like 10 frames. And it came out perfect. We, we just staged it. It was really funny. That's awesome. Um, then like with uh okay what's her Robin uh what's her name Robin, who plays uh uh Sarah uh Savick and Savick yeah Lee. they were just uh, talking uh, Dominic and they were just talking to her on the oh darn it what's Robin's last name Curtis Robin Curtis okay uh what she did is she let me stage. We did a reenact. There's a picture of her where she's working with Dr. Leonard Nimoy. He's directing. And he's got her, his arm around her, and he's sort of pointing off in the distance, kind of kind of explaining to her what she's about to do. Mm-hmm. And so we reenacted that. I pretended I was the director, and she was in my arm, and I was, like, pointing out to you, like, and I was saying, like, okay, Robin, what I want you to do is just stand out there by that rock, all right, and then look in the camera. But be careful. Don't trip over those cables. I just want you to look in the camera. And 
And while I was saying that, we had somebody else taking the picture. Nice. <laughs> and she was like, oh, Matt, you're such a card. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that kind of stuff, that's what's so fun about the vendor room is. And then, okay, here's another one I did. Uh, the lady, oh, darn, I can't remember her name, who played the salt monster in the original Star Trek. Uh, did you watch original Star Trek? Uh, I'm very underversed in original Star Trek. Okay. Well, maybe this might not mean anything to you, but <laughs> it's, um, there's this really gross looking salt monster thing that has the ability to, um, to appear to make an illusion in your mind. Yeah, that's it. That's the salt monster. Okay. The lady who played the salt monster was there. And um, she, um, and of course I was charming. I was like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Um, and now she's older. She was probably like uh, in the late sixties or seventies. And, um, but I was like, oh, you're, you're so beautiful. It's such a waste that they put that ugly mask on you. Oh God. And, um, and she was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, so then what we did as we staged a thing where I kneeled down, there's a scene in that show where the salt monster puts its hand on Captain Kirk's head like this and is trying to suck the salt out of him. Okay. And then he, he lets out this blood curdling scream. So we reenacted that oh, in the awesome. vendor room. I, I kneeled down and she put her hands on my head. And then I went, ah! <laughs> as loud as I could. And everybody looked like, what the hell is going on? That's hilarious. <laughs> and then once they saw, they were like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's why the vendor room is so fun. <laughs> yeah. So you got to go, Johnny. All right. Okay. So how, what's, how should we wrap up? So is there any new projects you'd like to promote? Uh, let's see. So I've got the Star Trek cruise, how to go on a Star Trek cruise okay. on the YouTube. So we can put out, a link please. to that. Uh, and please just, you know, watch it all the way through. There's a lot, uh, to watch emotionally, spiritually, physically, you know, I think mm -hmm. I, it's good. People have responded to it. Uh, but if you look at the YouTube metrics, mm -hmm. it says 735 views. But if you look at the view count, it's it's sort of like people stop watching it after two minutes. <laughs> so, that happens. I get the yeah. same thing in most of my videos. So it's discouraging. So I would encourage you to watch it all, all the way the through. through 12 minutes, half the episode of a bear, but much uh, funnier. And, um, and leave a like and a comment. The more yes. likes and comments we get on our videos, the more the YouTube algorithm likes us. Exactly. And, it, exactly. and then it, it's then it just it's share and also share it yeah share it on facebook and twitter or x as we say now yeah i'm really proud of it yeah. and you know if you watch it you get to see a noskin playing um uh, playing in a casino and you get to see matt weiss playing the cello the star trek cello guy about two thirds of the way through so that's pretty cool but they don't even know uh, me as matt weiss over here they know me as pranakasha matt Okay. Uh, Pranakasha right. Productions. Pranakasha Matt. A.K.A. Gotcha. Matt Weiss, A.K.A. the Star Trek <laughs> cello guy. I could be Johnny Lang, A.K.A. Zero Johnny, A.K.A. Johnny Lang Films. Mm -hmm. uh, another cool project is I uh, did a recreation of a scene from David Lynch's Eraserhead. Oh, cool. Which I spent a couple months building tiny sets to recreate oh. three minutes of the film. Wow. And it's all brought to you by a group on Instagram called Eraserhead 2049. Cool. So they just released their final scenes, and hopefully by the end of the year, they're going to have their fully fan-made recreation of Eraserhead. That's theirs or yours? Uh, I just submitted a four minutes a four minute scene to their project. Oh, I get it. So a bunch of filmmakers all submit a little chunk, and then they put it all together yeah. type of thing? Yeah. Okay, so check cool. it out on Instagram, Razorhead2049. Okay, we'll put a link uh, for that. How they're going to release it. I'm sorry? I will put a link for that down there. Yeah, we can do the yeah. Instagram. I'll send that to you after we're done here. Uh, okay. So that's cool. Let me just show you one of these little sets I built just because it's sitting right here. 
I don't know how mm. that's going to play. But imagine a black screen behind here and I have my little green screen actor come through and walk around like this industrial landscape I built out of like PVC and clay and all this stuff. So oh, cool. uh, between this and five other sets took about four months uh, to get wow. the can. But definitely a uh, uh, pretty fun uh, project that I'm pretty happy with. So that's fun. And then you said you, you shoot the actors on a green screen and then use that as a backdrop. Yeah. So I, took the actor and sort of floated them down. So I couldn't like have them walk very far. So I have to like, they've got like this sort of floating walk happening, which is pretty right. cool. Yeah. Kind of has the surrealness of it. Yep. And uh, then I, I collaborated with exactly friend, what you mean, did. because I've done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we added a musical scene. So it's a race your head and there's a brief moment of a musical interlude, which I think David Lynch would be proud of. Nice. Cause he loves his musical interludes. That's cool. So, so that's an exciting right. project. I don't know when that's going to see the light of day, but and I'm always working on something new. So continue to watch and subscribe on the YouTube, and uh, okay. you'll see something new hopefully every couple of weeks. Yep, Johnny Lang, and that's JohnnyLangFilms.com. Uh, nope, you just go on YouTube, Johnny Lang Films, Instagram slash Johnny underscore Lang underscore Films. Uh, there's no dot com yet. Okay, that's cool. Very good. All right, so we got to do our. Uh, this is how I close all my episodes. Live long and prosper, my friend. Live long and prosper. And I hope to meet you in June at your mom's second annual Star Trek convention. Yeah, that'd be cool if that works out. It'll be a lot of fun. I'll be there and definitely directing a stage reading. You have to decide what episode to do. Sounds good. And then uh, hopefully someday we'll meet in Vegas at a Star Trek STLV convention. That would be. Let's cool. make it happen. Let's It'll make it awesome. happen. All right, we'll get down here. All right, till next time. Take care. All right. everywhere. We get it.